Well, St. Benedict says that a monk should never begin any work at all. Ah, uh, there, that does help you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, I apo- well, I'll, I'll begin my apologies in a second. Let's pray first. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Benedict says that a monk should never begin any good work except that he should pray that God will finish it for him. So, um, God finish this for me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If he does, yeah, so if you get bored, you just look at the relics. Um, right. Uh, I, I Years and years ago, I saw Kurt Vonnegut speak, and he began by saying that a great orator never apologizes for what he's about to say. Um, but I never liked Kurt Vonnegut. I think he was kind of a sellout. So I have a whole list of apologies to begin with, the first of which is that um, if anything I say is in any way in contrast to Catholic teaching, ignore it. Um, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty orthodox, but sometimes I joke around and stuff, and who knows. Uh, but if I do, bring it up to me, and I'll take it back. Um, oh, the books are, you know, we talked about the books already. Oh, second of all, um, I played rugby for 18 years, and I got hit in the head so often that I have a permanent tremor. I actually have Parkinson's. It started, it launched us. So, if I if I do like that in the middle of my talk, you're not you're not in trouble, <laughs> and I'm not angry, and you don't have to wait back. <laughs> it's just me. Um, so and then Mother Sincletica of the Desert, who was one of the very first monks, she said it's a dangerous thing to teach virtue before you have mastered it yourself. He said, it's like inviting a traveler in to take shelter when your house is falling down. Um, Well, my house is falling down just like everybody else's. Um, But I invite you in anyway today. Um, Years and years ago, before I was a celebrity priest, as my buddies tell me, um, I was invited to give a talk to the East Coast Dominican, uh, by the East Coast Dominicans to... Um, the Diocese of Providence. And uh, just because they thought I was funny and the guys needed a break, I think. Um, And, uh, but like the day before I arrived, there was some horrible scandal. And it involved, I think, the bishop, though I don't want to say that for sure online, on record. Um, But in any case, it... uh, I was going to speak about evangelization, but unbeknownst to me, the night before, this news had broken, and when I got there, the priests were all just demoralized. And I'm up there telling my jokes and being funny and silly and calling people out, and da, 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 and it just went flat. Like the whole, it was just a disaster. And at the end of my talk, one of the priests raised his hands. Oh, I opened it up for questions, and. One of the priests raised his hand and he said, you're talking to us about evangelization. He says, but we've lost all credibility. Like, I just had the rug torn out from under me. He said, I- I've worked my whole life to win the trust of the, people, the holy people of God. And last night, it all came crashing down. I don't see how we can evangelize anyone. And I said something stupid like pray more or something. I mean, which isn't bad advice, but it doesn't help much when you're feeling bad. And, um, and got off the stage or off the altar. There you go. See, I've already preached heresy. Um, and, uh, and I was walking down the steps of the cathedral in a funk. And there are these kids out in front of the cathedral skateboarding on the steps. And this kid with like bright green hair, he screeches up to me, spray me with gravel. And he goes, hey, what the hell are you? Excuse me. He actually didn't even say hell, so I guess I did pretty well. Um, and I looked at him, and I really wasn't in the moment, so I just kind of looked at him, and I said, I'm a monk, what the hell are you? And, um, and then he was surprised. <laughs> And he said, oh, I'm a punk. What do monks do? And I said, well, monks pray. What do punks do? 
And he said, we pray. I said, well, pray for me then, punk. And he goes, pray for me, monk. And he skated off. And I was like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> and, um, but all of a sudden it occurred to me, and I ran back into the cathedral and up onto the altar and pushed, the, there was a speaker up, and I pushed her out of the way for a second. I said, guys, I understand now. Like, it, no, you're right. We, we, I, we have, we've all had the rug torn out from under us. We can't really, we can't, we don't really have anything to say, frankly. And we can't be any cooler or slicker or more impressive than what the world has to offer, especially not now. Um, but we can smile, you know, and that's, and, and, and that's, I guess, what I have to offer. Um, I joke, well, I say to people sometimes, like, it's, if I can't be holy, I can be funny at least. Um, but that's, I think that's what I have to offer to you, perhaps. And, and then maybe you can pass that along to your kids. Um, the, the, we have joy. We have joy. And the enemy doesn't have that. Um, we also have silence and we have humility. And, the, and, and we have the truth. And to top it off, we have some of the greatest stories ever. Um, so the title of this uh, series of talks is How to Slay Dragons. Um, but that's a misnomer, actually. It's kind of deceptive, really. I, I, year, um, about three years ago, I was asked to speak in Bremerton, Arkansas. No, Bennington, Arkansas. Um, there were no Catholic schools in Bennington, so this group of families got together and raised some money, went to the bishop, asked him to start a Catholic school, and he said no. So they got the diocesan exorcist to be their chaplain. They all mortgaged their homes and started a Catholic school, and and it's, just, it's, of course, it's called Ozark Academy. It's one of these classical academies. And they asked me to come out and talk about one of my books. And the guy who picked me up at the airport was named Matthew Abide. And um, he picked me up in his truck, and we were driving. It was a 20-minute drive. And about 10 minutes in, he looked over at me and goes, You know, I had a vision. And I thought, Oh, my God, not one of these people. Uh, because monks don't have visions. Like Carmelites maybe have visions and Passionists and Franciscans, but monks just we we, we just get the job done. Uh, those of you who know Father Linus know what I'm talking about. Like it's not a lot of frou frou. We just we just say our prayers and go back to ourselves. Or at Labora, but I was stuck in the truck with him, so I said, "Oh really? Tell me about it." And he said, "Well." I was in the Garden of the Apocalypse, and the dragon turned up. So I grabbed a flaming sword, and I went running toward the dragon. When St. Peter stepped out and said, hey, give me that, and took the sword away from me, handed me a pair of pruning shears, and said, uh, go prune your corner of the garden. I will take care of the dragon. Um, and so, so I guess the, the, the spoiler alert, you can't fight dragons, uh, and it's not our job anyway. Um, and I know this parish is like what on the slate to be renewed and everybody's upset about that. Everybody's upset about the Pope or the Bishop or the President or whatever. But really, these are dragons we can't slay. Um, and frankly, I, 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 well, I don't, I'm going to get in trouble here. But whenever somebody complains to me about the whole renewing God's whatever plan or something, um, I just ask them how many kids they have in the seminary. And then they shut up usually. Um, <laughs> Because really, if we had like 100, 300, well, we do, well, I don't know, whatever. The point is, we need, we need more priests, more monks, so if you, if you can do that, just pray for vocations. Um, so the other thing is, I've totally changed all the sections as well. Um, I've decided that the only way to really um, fight dragons is to be a monk. Um, and I'll explain a little of that later. But uh, So the first talk, this morning will be Monasticism 101, Silence. Uh, and I'll tell you about the reasons for it and techniques and pitfalls. Uh, then Monasticism 201 will be the second talk, and that will be obedience uh, to God, to authority, to your neighbor, even obedience to your enemies. Uh, and then Monasticism 301, which is death. Um, and then advanced monasticism at the very end, which is failure. Uh, unsurprisingly. Um, 
and well, okay. So at my ordination mass, um, the first reading was the call of Elijah, and I remember this very clearly because the lector at that mass left out the crucial last sentence of the reading. Uh, he left out, "Here I am, send me," which is the whole point of the passage. Right? Otherwise, it's just a depressing list of all of the terrible things he's had to go through. Um, well, fast forward 20 years, and um, I find myself smiling kind of condescendingly on that young priest who would make such a, a demand of God, send me, here I am, send me. Um, and if I'm going to be honest, which of course I have to be, uh, there have been times when I question the wisdom of the decision I made that day. Uh, knowing how hard the life of a prophet can be, why would anyone volunteer for that, right? Um, now, the gospel reading at that Mass also played a huge part in my discernment process. At a crucial moment during my novitiate, when, when I was absolutely certain that St. Louis Abbey was not for me, I had a very vivid daydream. Uh, this this in, in, in itself unusual. I spend really most of my life daydreaming, but... On this occasion, I had been reading about the call of Peter, and I imagined that I was on the beach that day at Gennesaret, uh, and I, I too was packing up my nets and tackle, and I looked up the beach, and there was Jesus, and he was walking along the shore in my direction, and he was choosing apostles, and so on he came, and he was walking toward me, and as he drew closer, I could see he, was, he had determination in his eyes, and, and, he was, and he walked straight toward me, and he came closer and closer, and just as he got to my boat, he stopped, and he turned around, and he chose the guy in the boat next to me and walked away. And um, I thought to myself, well, was this a sign maybe that I wasn't called to the priesthood? Um, and if I'd felt relieved, I'd say yes, but instead I became, um, I got a little angry. I mean, it was my daydream, darn it. So I rebooted it. I, I rebooted the daydream, and I went and ran after him saying, hey, 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 come back here. You forgot me. Here I am. Choose me. Call me. Send me. Um, now, the truth is, I mean, th these have been hard years to be a Catholic. They've been hard years to be a Christian. They've been really hard years to be a priest, certainly hard, and they've been the hardest yet for, for my beautiful community in St. Louis. Um, but I knew when I signed up that we might have a hard go of it. Um, I was told that we were going to lose men. I was warned that the life of a Christian wasn't going to be easy. Um, sorry, I lost it. Uh, yeah, and then I'd find myself on the front lines of a, of a battle for souls. And I was told that every soldier, when he comes face to face with the enemy, he questions his decision to fight. But a good soldier knows that for the sake of his brothers, he's got to stand his ground. Um, well, I was sharing this with some of my students not too long ago, and one of them said, well, look, I know you guys are like the Navy SEALs of the church, but... This is like Black Hawk Down or something. <laughs> and, and it does feel like that sometimes. But, you know, there were those who deliberately parachuted into that fight. Uh, I mean, knowing, they, knowing the odds, in fact, knowing they were going to die, they deliberately put themselves in harm's way. And, and they wanted to be there, even. And I believe those men were heroes. Um, so... Here you all are, here we all are, alike, lay people and priests and whatnot, and we're in the thick of it, and, and the pressure is unbearable, and the enemy has us surrounded, right? And some of us are very discouraged. Uh, some have run away. Some of uh, my brothers have simply cracked under the pressure of it. Uh, but I told my student, and I've told my brother monks, and I can surely speak for many of us here this morning when I say that there's nowhere, really there's nowhere in the world I'd rather be right this moment than right here. Uh, and you all parachuted in on, on a Saturday morning, and I'm grateful. 
So pray for me and I'll be praying for you. And let's pray together for vocations to the priesthood. Um, like I said, we've had a hard go of it at St. Louis Abbey. We were 33 monks at one point. Today we're down to 12, I think. And um, and I was, well, I was going to say complaining, but it was a little worse than that to my dad about this. And he sent me a, uh, <laughs> he sent me a, a quote from Winston Churchill. Uh, not a great theologian, probably not a saint, but he was a great soul nonetheless, and a steadfast soul. And, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to have trouble getting through this, actually. It's easier when you're talking to people who don't really believe this stuff. Um, <laughs> there you go, then I'm back. A soul, he was a soul who, uh, who, when it looked like people were likely to lose heart, when his, in fact, when his, own, when his own cabinet decided to oust him, he gave a speech which steeled their resolve. And I, I, when, when I became vocation director <laughs> two years ago, I, I printed this out and put it over my, ta my desk. Um, and I find myself reading it every morning, and it always takes on a slightly different meaning. But he's, and I'll read a little bit of it for you now. He says, look, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We should prepare ourselves, in fact, for hard and heavy things. And I have only to add that nothing which may happen in the battle can in any way relieve us of our, <laughs> sorry, of our, sometimes I cry for effect, but this is not one of those, this is not one of those moments. Um, nothing that, can, that may happen in this battle can in any way relieve us of our duty to defend the cause to which we have vowed ourselves. Nor should it destroy our confidence in our power to make our way through disaster and through grief to the ultimate defeat of our enemy. And when we see the originality of his malice, the ingenuity of aggression which our enemy displays, we may certainly prepare ourselves for every hard, brutal, and treacherous maneuver, but at the same time, I hope, and I hope with a steadfast eye, for even though many have fallen and may fall into the grip of the enemy and the odious apparatus of his rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength. We shall defend our home, our church, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight in the landings, we shall fight on the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Or to put it in more biblical terms, um, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. So, Monk 101, we'll start with silence. I could talk all day about it, but I think I won't. Um, <laughs> Just about exactly two years ago, I was, no, no, it wasn't even, well, I was giving a retreat in Bremerton, Washington, when right in the middle of one of my talks, the door at the back of the church slammed open and a homeless man walked in. Uh, he walked straight down the center aisle and he plopped himself in the front row and he kicked out his feet and, and gestured for me to continue. Um, so I smiled and I picked up more or less where I left off, but just as I started to get back into the rhythm of the sermon, he let out an enormous yawn. And then another. And finally he stood up and he turned around to the congregation and he said, boring. And he walked out again. Um, and there was a bit of nervous laughter. <laughs> like that, yep. <laughs> and, and I started over and the homeless guy didn't come back. And by and large, the retreat was a success. And people came out to me afterward, and they said the usual nice stuff. And, uh, but that night, around 3 o'clock in the morning, I suddenly woke up with this quote from Mother Teresa running through my head. She said, you will know Christ when you see him in the distressing disguise of the poor. And then it occurred to me, like, Jesus Christ had come to my retreat. 
and I found it boring. <laughs> As of course he would, since it was all stuff he already knew. And then it really hit me. I mean, like the full force of the opportunity I had missed, Jesus had come to my talk. And I didn't even ask him to say a few words. I didn't, I didn't ask for his advice. I didn't even ask for his blessing, for crying out loud. Instead, I smiled politely and waited for him to leave, which, of course, he did. Um, so here's my last disclaimer <laughs> before we begin. <laughs> uh, I may have published a best-selling book on humility, but, uh, that was a joke, but I can assure you, well, it's not a joke, it's actually a best-selling book on humility, but I can assure you that my house is falling down, but I'm going to welcome you inside anyway. Um, so, um, the very first monk I ever met uh, was on, I was working as an archaeologist in Rome, and um, there's a bus, for, I was digging in the Roman Forum, the, the Temple of the Vestals, and uh, I would take the bus from the Forum to the Vatican, which is famous actually for its pickpockets. And um, so you learn to know who the pickpockets are and avoid them and whatnot and deal with them. But this one day when I got on the bus, there was a monk at the other end. I didn't even know monks existed at that point. Um, but the pickpocket was working his way toward him, and eventually the pickpocket was right next to him and leaning over. Well, the thing is, in, in Rome, if you, want to, if you see a pickpocket doing his thing, you don't, um, you don't tell anyone because then he gets nervous or afraid he might hurt somebody getting off the bus. So instead what you do is you walk up next to him and you give him a shove. And then they hit the person they're trying to pickpocket, and that person wakes up and notices, and then the guy gets off at the next stop, and no harm done. Um, so I did that. I walked over, and I shoved him into this monk, and, um, and the monk didn't notice. Um, so the pickpocket goes at him again. I shoved him again. And this time the pickpocket looks at me and goes, <laughs> so instead I turned around, I tapped on the shoulder, I said, excuse me. He said, yes. Queste un said, this is, this is a, he says, are you an American? I was like, yes, this is a pickpocket. He's trying to pick your pocket. And he goes, yeah, I know. He says, I don't have any pockets. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, so that was, that was my first discovery. I thought to myself, well, this is an extraordinary person, or at least he lives an extraordinary life. I got to get to know him. And I did, and we became good friends. Um, his name was Francisco Schulte, so pray for him, uh, because He's one of two priests who have had a decisive uh, influence on my vocation. Um, he all, well, anyway, yeah. Um, so anyway, he, uh, I wanted to stay on after working as an archaeologist, and he found me a job as a janitor in his monastery. And um, so I spent the summer in Rome working as a janitor. And something you got to understand about Rome is in the summer is that about once every five or six days, all the electricity goes out because, well, uh, because the uh, because the electric company is run by Italians, right? <laughs> and and what happened was um, the all the electricity went out for about three and a half hours one afternoon. When it came back on, there was an old trappist stuck in the in the elevator, and so as the janitor, I was required to get him out so I spent about another half hour prying the doors open and pulling them out and when he did come out he, he was he looked he was smiling from ear to ear I couldn't believe it and I said to him what's your problem which <laughs> isn't a real nice thing to say uh, and he said to me problem it's like I just spent three and a half hours in an elevator and he walked away and I thought to myself I've got to ask him about that later which I did and, I, and he said, look, I, I, I'm a Trappist. Like, I have given up everything to, to pursue a life of prayer, of silence and solitude and contemplation. He's like, and, and I filled it up with things to do. He's like, I've, I, I fill it up with lectures and books to read and prayers and, and, and whatnot. He's like, but there I was in that elevator, man. I had nowhere to go. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't hear anything. He's, he's, it was perfect. I just sat there and I prayed. And I went back to my room that night and I wrote in my journal, I could never be a monk, but <laughs> there's a power there that I want. Whatever that guy has, like, 
that's what I want. Like, if I had been stuck in an elevator, I'd been clawing at the walls. Like, but here he was. Like, what would have been anyone else's? The the low point of their week was the high point of his year. Um, and and this really struck me because I thought to myself, well, the next time I'm in stuck in traffic, I'm gonna pretend I'm a monk. Like the next time I get stuck behind some. I used to say old lady at a grocery store, but I'll say old man at a grocery store. Um, I'll just say, oh, great, I'm, I'm a monk. I, I'll just be a monk right now and, and pray. Um, and there really is a prayer. That there's a power that comes with silence that, um, that even just a little bit of silence. I try to get my, my students to, to spend two or three minutes a day at the beginning of the day just wasting your time, just silently wasting that moment or two. Um, and the, I, the monks at our school think that, or the, sorry, the students at our school think the monks have magic powers because I'll, you know, you'll see a kid and you'll say, hey, are you doing all right? And they'll go, I was hiding that. How did you know? You know, I go, well, because I shut up long enough to listen to you. you know? um, the, the, there's a very ancient, uh, I thought, let's see, how much, how much time do I have? A4, I got 10 minutes. There's a very, well, we're going to have some time for silent prayers, certainly while confessions are being offered. Um, and there's a very ancient prayer that the very first monks uh, invented. Uh, they were very simple men, and they didn't have very deep theology. It wasn't deep, but it was profound, and they were called the Desert Fathers. And they just went, they, their solution, they, what they really wanted to do was get martyred, but they couldn't. So they went out into the desert by themselves, and and they would compete with one another for holiness. They called themselves the Athlete Dei. But they, but the problem was, of course, that when you, as soon as you start to try to pray, immediately your mind is full of distractions. The Buddhists call this monkey mind. We, we had... We had these wonderful uh, Buddhist monks come and stay at the monastery about 20 years ago. And they didn't bring a translator, so we had nothing to say. Because they didn't speak English, we didn't speak Chinese or whatever it is. They, I think they, do they speak Tibetan? No, I think they speak Chinese. Anyway, the point is, we had, no, we had no way to communicate, so we just sort of sat around looking at each other. Until the last day they were there, they got, finally got a translator in. And um, he... and. Then we just sat there some more looking at each other because we didn't have anything to ask. Uh, but one of the novices finally said to the translator, would you ask them, what do they do about distractions? Um, and so the translator turned around and talked to them. And then they all started laughing. And, and the novice got real red in the face. He was like, are they making fun of me? He's like, no, no, no. He's like, they're saying to each other, oh, these are monks. <laughs> because it, and it wasn't until they heard about the distractions that they realized what we actually did for a living. That, um, that thanks be to God, that's a problem even in Buddhist prayer, um, which I don't particularly understand, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, but anyway, so these original monks, they, they had these distractions, constant distractions, even out there in the desert. Uh, Abba Theodorus of Gaza, who is one of my favorites, uh, starts his book, his, his book of conferences by, by saying, look, we gave up everything to come out here in the desert. So, and yesterday I saw two of you fighting over a shovel. Right? The, the, you will, the, the devil will find a way to get in there, no matter how isolated you make yourself. So the, the, the big issue for them was how to keep the devil at bay. And so, of course, they went to the scriptures, and they found this passage in St. Paul that says, at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Um, and the name, you know, the, 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 well, okay. And so they thought, oh, okay, well, if I just say Lord Jesus, well, then the demons got to take a knee. In fact, there's a, a story about one of the desert fathers that he was beat up by a demon for three days in his cell. And on the third day, the demon finally dragged him out by his hair. And he said, Lord Jesus, help me. At which point the devil disappeared and Jesus appeared to him and, he said, and the monks started crying and thanked him and he said, well, why didn't you call sooner? <laughs> um, that, that the idea being that like every demon that could possibly bother you has to take a knee. Every angel, all of creation and 
the demons themselves have to take a knee. So the devil's saying, aren't you angry at him? Don't you want to? You go, Jesus. He goes, oh, come on. <laughs> but really, you'd rather Jesus. Oh, okay. But aren't you a hunk? Jesus? Okay. And, and so, so they would say the name of Jesus over and over and over again. But that's, of course, that only takes care of the evil part. What they really wanted was to pray without ceasing, right? To pray constantly, to be, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Um, and so that became a problem. But then they re went back to the scriptures and they found uh, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the power of the Spirit. So they thought, well, if I say Jesus is Lord, I know that I'm full of the Spirit, right? There's a guarantee there in the scriptures. So they would just keep saying that over and over again. And eventually it evolved into, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ. And you say it with your breathing so that it becomes part of everything you do. And they called it, wait for it, the Jesus Prayer. Um, <laughs> because it, it focused on that name, which is above every other name. Um, the, you, as a scholar of ancient history, uh, I, I've... I, I, I know the power of, the, uh, of a name, right? Even the Egyptians realized if you knew the, a name, you had a power over somebody. Like they, 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 um, the, there's a whole theology in, in, in Judaism about names and knowing the names of demons and knowing the names of angels and knowing each other's names. And for God to turn around and give his name to the, pe to the Jewish people was this major... Like, he, he makes himself vulnerable in this weird, unique way to this one small, weird, unique group of people. Um, in fact, it's so sacred, this name, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, that a pious Jew will never pronounce it out loud. I have a great friend named Jordan Cherik. He's one of the benefactors of our monastery. He's an Orthodox Jew. That's a whole other story for another time. But uh, we were talking, he loves to come and debate scripture with the monks, so... He, we were talking about names in the Old Testament. He said, well, all, you can basically tell the good guys from the bad guys because the bad guys have Baal in their name, like Jerubbaal and um, uh, Ishbaal. Uh, but the good guys have the names of God in their name, like Elijah. And I was like, Elijah. I was like, oh, yeah, right, El Yahweh. And he looked at me and he goes, <sighs> and I looked around and I was like, <gasps> I was like, I just said the name, and he said, yes. And I said, I said I'm so sorry. He said, it's okay, it's, your, it's my law, not your law, <laughs> all right? Um, but he had actually never heard it pronounced until that moment. Um, but here's the cool thing, is that we have the name of God, and it's Jesus, and his mom called him, and his friends called him Jesus, and we can repeat that name as often as we like, and whenever we like. And not only does it have the power of filling us with the Holy Spirit, it has the power of uh, keeping every demon on its knees. So I, 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 I love. I, someone was asking me if I had one of my rosaries. I love to make rosaries. I've never actually finished saying a rosary though, because I always end up saying the Jesus prayer, um, which is, I guess, okay for a monk. Um, I must have finished one in a group at some point. But anyway, the point it being that, like, what happens is that if you say this enough, it becomes part of your breathing. And then it becomes part of your sleeping and part of your night. And then all of a sudden, you begin to learn to pray without ceasing. Our, our founding abbot, Abbot Luke Rigby, I was privileged to be at his bedside at his death. Um, the monks have a tradition which, um, where the two monks sit on either side of your bed and pray while the monk dies. And, and we keep vigil all night and the next day. And, and I was keeping vigil for Father Luke, and he was in a coma. But he had taught me to, the, the Jesus prayer, and I know he said it every day of his life, because in a coma, he was saying the Jesus prayer. It had just become part of the way he breathed. He was going, Lord Jesus Christ, how many ways? Lord Jesus Christ, how many ways? Right, right? Amazing. And to imagine that, that I, and I don't think that's necessarily, I mean, yes, it's a sign of holiness, but it's not impossible for you and me to get to that stage because it's just a physical thing, right? Um, I was actually, but, but, but here's the thing, okay, and this is the warning, um, that don't get too caught up in the technique, right? I, 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 was, 
I was invited to give a, a retreat out in Bowling Green, Missouri, uh, a ways back. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and that, you're from there? Oh. Oh, they are good people. They're great people. Uh, and the year I was asked to go out, the whole football team had decided to get there confirmed. Um, so it was a confirmation retreat. But the, um, the, the youth minister made the tragic mistake of introducing me as the cool priest, which absolutely did not fly with these guys. And they were not, they, they didn't want anything to do with the cool priest, right? So I decided to make it a silent retreat. And, um, and, I, and, 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 they, and I taught them a little bit about the Jesus, the Jesus prayer. And then I, I, we had 20 minutes of silence. And, and these guys like got into it. I kind of stumbled into success because I said, look, guys, I don't know if you can handle this, but we're going to try it anyway. And all of a sudden, I had their complete, they are like, handle what? We can handle this. What do you what, handle? Yeah, I can handle it. And I was like, well, we're going to try silence. And they're like, well, I can be more silent than this guy. This guy's an idiot. You know? And they were competing at, like Desert Fathers. They were competing to see who could be the most silent, right? And we did 20 minutes, we did 40 minutes. At the end of the day, we did an hour straight of silence. There was this one kid, I, called, I started calling him Flex, because uh, he would sit in the corner and he'd go, <laughs> <laughs> he was like six foot six, these big old corn fed Missouri boys. And, uh, but then during that hour, all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot to tell him about the rosary. I mean, like, like, and I forgot to tell them about the dangers, because I've taught kids this who came back and said, oh, yeah, God spoke to me and said, like, you know, women should be ordained or something. You know, I'm like, well, wait, hold on a second. There, there are checks and balances here that need to be um, explored. Um, and then I started to realize, like, I forgot to tell them about the demon part, and I forgot to tell them about the angel, the full of the spirit part. And by the time the bell rang, like, uh, I, I hadn't actually started praying yet. And they all came back all psyched up. And Flex is sitting in the front row, and he's like, I think I heard Jesus, you know. And, and I'm like, well, guys, I, I have an apology to make. Like, while you were praying, I was just sitting there thinking all the stuff I forgot to tell you. And Flex gets real confused. He raises his hand. He goes, well, how do you know that isn't Jesus trying to remind you of the stuff you forgot? And I was like, Dark! <laughs> Like, like, finally, Jesus speaks to me, and, and I'm like, shh, trying to pray here. Um, I, think, I, think, I think we have that problem a lot. Like, when we go to, like, I, 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 somebody told me not too long ago, like, I, I go to Mass, but it's, I, I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of it because I'm so distracted. I was like, well, what are you thinking about? He's like, work. I'm like, well, this is your, ch the, how do you know that isn't Jesus saying, bring your work to me, bring your work to Mass, like, yeah, go ahead. I mean, you don't want to go to Mass with the intention of working out all your problems from work. But on the other hand, like, you can't be sure that the distractions aren't the voice of God. So St. Joseph Martyr says that you deal with these distractions during prayer the way you deal with, like, boats coming down a river. The one thing you don't do is jump in the river and try to push the boat back upstream because that'll destroy you. You acknowledge it and you watch it pass, and then you get on with your prayer. Um, okay, that was my alarm, which means I have three minutes. Uh, I wanted to talk about Benedictine apologetics, but I think it's probably time to, to shut down here. Um, well, no, I'll, I'll speak for three minutes, <laughs> and then I'll tell you as much as I can, um, which is that um, w the way Jesuits do apologetics, they research the answers, which is... Which is why, by the way, people who complain about Jesuits, and I'm, I actually got officially in trouble once because I made my rugby team spit every time we said Jesuit. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It was, it was supposed to be funny, but it didn't. Because they always beat us in rugby. But, uh, but uh, when people complain about them, I say, look, they are paid. We, we, we pay these guys to explore the edges of orthodoxy and find solutions. If some of them fall off the edge, like we, that's to be expected, right? And by the way, there's a new generation of these guys coming up that are going to knock your socks off. There, there are three of them at SLU that are rocking the world out there. But um, 
So the Jesuits research the answers. The Dominicans develop rhetoric, right? They preach. But the Benedictines, the way we, we fight is that we listen. <laughs> and, and if you don't think that sounds very effective, um, read any history of our order. We've been exterminated by Vikings, Huns, Puritans, Communists, Henry VIII, Napoleon Cromwell, Saladin, Stalin. All of them did everything they could to wipe us out. In fact, every hundred years or so, someone decides they're going to get rid of the monks. Um, and every couple hundred years, it starts to look like they might pull it off. Um, but pff, here we are today. Here I am. There are over 1,200 Benedictines in the world. And, uh, and where did all the Vikings go, right? <laughs> Apologies to any Vikings in the room, but we won that one. Uh, and how did we do it? We did it. We, we defeated the most violent, aggressive movements in the history of the world by listening. Um, and, and I'm going to teach you how to do that perhaps when we get back. Um, uh, I'll go fast forward. Uh, yeah, I, I'll teach you. I'll leave that on a cliffhanger, and, and we'll, we'll have Mass now. And uh, one of the great beauties of the old Mass, which I, I'm lucky enough to say. Oh, and by the way, you know, when, the, when, when Francis came out with his motto proprio, I got all these emails from our alumni saying, oh, my gosh, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll write the bishop a letter. And in the meantime, I'll say Mass 1 in Latin with prayers at the foot of the altar and the Gospel of John afterwards, and no one will be able to tell the difference. Right? And I did. And, and the bishop wrote back saying, say it anywhere you want, anytime you like, whenever you please. So I actually say the, the Old Mass now more than I did before. I, really, it's the, we can get so distracted by what's going on up there Pacamamas and whatever, and, and it's just not our business. Oh, and by the oh yeah, the Pacamama thing. I have. Uh, <laughs> I have a friend who is in Rome and and was his, and worked as his, as uh, Pope Francis's MC, and he has, he told me that he had that Francis had this yelling fit with the Fran, with the with the Franciscan that set up that meeting, right? That he said. How could you do this to me? How could you make me look like this? What was I going to do in front of those old women? Now what am I going to do with the statue? Granted, I might have done it a little differently, but I didn't think, it seemed, it looked to me like he was all being all pagan or something, but apparently he got pretty PO'd at the guy who orchestrated it. So, you know, so take everything you read. Don't, in fact, stay off of YouTube. Just make me miserable. Anyway, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll talk about Benedictine apologetics next and get on with our lives. In case you haven't noticed, I don't do this very often. So this is your chance to minister to me through patience. And there are lots of silent and wonderful moments. Um, we often hear our lady praise in terms of gentle we often hear our lady praise in terms of like a gentle, loving, merciful, even sorrowful. Don Augustine Delat writes of Mary's heroic docility. And these are all beautiful signs of her perfect love for us. So we read in Gen Genesis 3.15 that God tells Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So how do we reconcile such titles with a word like enmity? The word suggests a blood feud, even hatred. She hates Satan. So I teach at a boys' school in St. Louis called Priory, run by monks. And when I read this passage to my students, they latch right onto it. They get it. Mary's no wimp. Her immaculate conception guarantees that she will hate evil and hate it with a perfect hate. She stares down Satan himself. In ancient Greece, the early Christians used to depict Mary with the same iconography that they did of Athena Parthenos. Oh, there we go. The, in ancient Greece, they used to depict Mary with the same iconography as Athena Parthenos, the warrior goddess of wisdom, bearing the storm shield, shaking her spear at evil, Mary goes to war for us, and Satan is terrified. 
I used to think that Joseph wanted to divorce Mary because he found she was pregnant and was ashamed of her. But how could any man possibly be ashamed of a woman like that? No, if you read the passage closely, you find that there's no evidence that Joseph doubts his wife's fidelity. Instead, we are told only that he is righteous. And we may infer from the angel's words that he is also afraid. The angel says to him, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Not don't be ashamed to take Mary as your wife. And behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said this, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. In an instant, he realizes this isn't just a great woman he's marrying. This is the new Ark of the Covenant, a treasure so holy no mortal man may touch it. And he's humbled. Remember the bizarre story from the second book of Samuel, where Uzzah, the son of Abinadab, he sees that the ark is tipping over and reaches out to steady it and he's struck dead just like that. The story is in the Bible for a reason. The ark, the locus of God's covenant, is sacred. It's mightily, frighteningly sacred. So sacred that no mortal man may touch it under any circumstances. And Mary is the new ark. So Joseph is terrified. A few summers ago, I went home to visit my family and we watched a really awful movie called, by the way, to Colin Culkin, called The Good Son. Uh, surprisingly, it turned out to be a movie about a bad son. Uh, in fact, this particular son was a homicidal maniac. Uh, and at the end of the movie, his mother ends, ends up holding him by his hand off the edge of a cliff. And in her other hand is someone else's son, who is not a house on the way yet. And in fact, it's quite a nice kid. So she can't hold on to, her, on to both of them, and she has to make a choice. So after the movie, I turned to my mother, and I asked her, if it was dead to me, hanging off the cliff, and she didn't even wait for me to finish. She said, oh, you. <laughs> what really surprised me was that she didn't even have to think about the answer. She said, I would choose my children over anything and anyone in the world, including your father. And dad was just like. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I've done a sort of informal survey over the past few years. And guess what? I have never met a mom who would answer otherwise. I, I, I've never met a mom who even hesitated with her answer. And it, to me, that is a terrifying kind of love. There's a painting in my home in an out-of-the-way spot in the back of the house that my mother did when I was a child. And my mother is a kind of a famous artist. It was Halloween. And my sister and I went trick-or-treating, and some of the bullies on our block beat me up and stole our candy. I was 35. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I was eight and my sister was six. Anyhow, my, my mother is a, my, as I said, my mother's an artist, so a few days later she went to the studio and she painted this painting of us. It's a dark painting and my sister and me are in our Halloween costumes, and we're crying, and we're walking through a forest. And back of us, suspended from the trees by their necks, are the bullies. <laughs> Dead. That terrifies me, that kind of love. <laughs> and while it may surprise my students to hear that a mother could have such a deep and violent emotion, I'll bet it doesn't surprise any of the moms here. Not at all. A mother understands this formidable bond between mothers and sons. And this is why, by the way, the most powerful prayer in the world, aside from the Eucharist, is that of a mother for her son, for her child. All we sons can do is be grateful and try to respect it, try to respect them. The love of a mother for her son, after all, 
is an icon of God's love for us. It's not a perfect icon. That's why we pray to God as Father. He has a more detached kind of love. I was telling, I, was, I mentioned this to my students the other day, and one woman said, Yogi, my mother would never let me go to hell. <laughs> I mean, she just wouldn't do it. She'd say, oh, forget, just go up here anyway. <laughs> but that's a theological issue I'll have to explain in another sermon. Suffice to say that this love, this formidable love, this fearsome love, a love so powerful that Satan himself trembles in its presence, this love of a mother for her child, Mary has this love for us, her adopted children, her sons and daughters. And precisely because she's the immaculate conception, she loves us with a purity and an intensity that even our own earthly mothers can't hope to rival. So I wrote a litany, my own litany to Our Lady that I say with my students. I'll say it now with sober, cooler titles. Our Lady, Queen of Angels, pray for us. Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, pray for us. Tower of David, pray for us. Lady of Victories, pray for us. Valiant Woman, pray for us. Bulwark of the Faithful, pray for us. Invincible Warrior, pray for us. New Ark of the Covenant, Stronghold of God, pray for us. Guardian of Christ, pray for us. Mighty Mistress, pray for us. Invincible Wall, pray for us. Sworn Enemy of Satan, pray for us. Deliverer of Christian nations, pray for us. Terror of the demons of hell, pray for us. Empress of the Golden Throne, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.